Welcome to Countdown to College Game Day presented by Samsung QLED TV. Leading into game day at 9 a.m. Eastern, well, they'll be coming live from West Point, New York, the site of this year's Army-Navy game that is significant. It's the first time the game has been held at West Point since World War II. That game traditionally held in Philadelphia, moved to West Point after COVID restrictions were put in place by the state of uh, Pennsylvania that wouldn't allow them to play this game. Before we get to anything else, this game is about more than just football. This is usually a game in and of itself on its own weekend. And we want to give it all the love that it deserves. So kudos to Army and Navy and everything that they sacrificed to be able to even play a football game. She's Christine Williamson. I'm Jason Fitz. Again, this is Countdown to College Game Day. We're going to spend the next 30 minutes hanging out, getting you ready for this morning, and getting you caught up with everything you need to know. We like to start with a little fun we call the top, where 40 seconds goes on the clock, and we each get to get something off of our chest. Christine! I want to go yeah. first. Oh, Why? Yeah. Because I feel like it. And so we'll throw 40 seconds up on the clock. I'm going to get this off my chest. Let's go. What does the college football playoff committee care about? Apparently, it's not losing football games because Iowa State has two stinking <laughs> losses and they are still sitting above Cincinnati. Like, did we reach a point where losses don't matter? And if losses don't matter, why are they burying Indiana? I know Indiana doesn't have their starting quarterback, but last time I checked, that hasn't hurt them on the field. Indiana has one loss, and that's to Ohio State. That's a top team. Why are we judging Indiana so harshly while we're giving Iowa State love? I, I realize that quantity of games matters and that's part of what everybody's going to talk about body of work we've seen more games you have also seen more losses if i'm cincinnati i am livid at last week's college fo football playoff committee rankings because they moved iowa state up for no reason wow fired up i mean i feel like i, I talked about this last week a little bit and we're trying to vibe check the cfp <laughs> big 12 bias Go ahead. <laughs> but no i was gonna say i feel like there's a little bit of politics the cfp is right across the street from the big 12 uh, headquarters, so I'm not. I would not be surprised if there was a little bit of nudging going on from their neighbors. I like the theory on that. All right, so it's your turn. We'll throw 40 seconds up on the clock. Are you ready? Yeah. You feeling good? I'm feeling great. Okay, here we go. We're gonna try this. The way she goes. Okay, so this season we knew was gonna be a lot different, right? There are 65 Power Five conference football teams. Of those 65, only 10 have not been affected by COVID-19. Syracuse, Iowa, Rutgers, Penn State, Iowa State, Kansas State, Texas Tech, Kentucky, South Carolina, and Oregon State are the only teams that have not been impacted. Oregon has also played five out of five games like Oregon State, but their game versus Washington this weekend was canceled. So we knew that COVID was going to greatly impact this season, but we did not know how much it was going to impact it. Well, it's funny you mentioned that because it brings us to a very big story right now in college football around Boston College. Earlier this week, Boston College announced they're not going to participate in their bowl game. Now, significant note here, Boston College, since they came back in June, have had one positive COVID-19 test. That's it. Over 9,000 tests administered, they've had one positive test. But they become the first bowl eligible team to announce it would not play in the postseason. The decision was made after significant player input. And head coach Jeff Halfley said, quote, we decided the biggest reward we could give these players was to be able to go and let them finish finals and go spend time with their families. They've earned it, and they deserve it. So with, Boston's with Boston College's decision not to play in a bowl game, let's get some expertise. Coach Jim Mora and also David Pollock joining us. Gentlemen, thank you so much for the time. Hope everyone's safe and well. Uh, let's get into this a little bit, Coach. When you see a school deciding they don't want to play in a bowl game, do you think that this starts a trend? Well, I, I don't know if it starts a trend, but I think we might see a little bit more of it. A bowl game is supposed to be a reward for a great season or at least a – I guess in these days, a six and six season. But this year is different. You know, there's been a lot of, uh, of adversity. These players and coaches and staffs have had to overcome a lot. There's been a lot of pressure on them. Uh, I'm not sure that it's reward it once was. You know, David can tell you as a player, you used to go into the town, you'd have fun, you'd go out with your buddies, you'd blow off some steam, you get some nice gifts, and you get prepared and play a great game on TV in front of a lot of fans. Now you're going to be locked up in a hotel room for however many nights you're there. Maybe it's one, maybe it's two, maybe it's three. You're not going to have all the events. So 
I, I'm not sure that it's quite the reward, and I think these players and these staffs are a little bit worn out right now. Well, and that makes sense. I mean, Pollock, when we were together yesterday on College Football Live, you mentioned that the mental aspect of this is a drain on players right now. You're out with people on site at game day. I mean, what sense are you getting when you're on campuses about sort of how everybody's holding up through curious times? Well, I mean, you think about it, like, you, you got to find releases, all of us, by the way, not just not just these players. We always got to find a place to, to blow off some steam and get an outlet and get away from whatever it is you're doing. And it could be the most fun thing in the history of the world. You still need that break, and they don't really have that right now. Like, I used to love going and playing video games with my boys. Well, now you can't really get together in, in large groups. You used to, like, go out to eat with your boys. You used to like to go downtown with your boys. Like, all the things you could do. You know, there's there's obviously been limits on it, and there's been and there's a reason you're trying to play for you know a championship, you're trying to get a season in, and all that stuff. And now, you know, it's the end, and you've been getting jammed in the back of your nose. And you're, you, by the way, coaches that we've seen across the country, you know, every single one of them talks about mental health being way up, and and having to be um, counselors, and having to have that a part of the daily regimen because it's just been a grind for these kids, and they haven't been able to see their families as much, and their families haven't been able to come up to the games, and the fans haven't been there. So I think it's taken its toll, and I understand why Boston College has made this decision. Coach, if you were coaching a team right now in this environment, would you take them to a bowl game? I would leave it up to my team leaders. I'd obviously have to have discussions with the administration because there are financial ramifications you have to consider. But uh, my inclination would be if they didn't want to go, I wouldn't want to take them. I mean, we see them play on Saturdays, and we see them celebrate touchdowns and sacks and great runs, and it's fun and it's entertaining. But we don't know what these players and coaches and staffs go through on a day-to-day -day basis during the week just to get ready for Saturday. And David m mentioned it. It's a grind. I mean, it is not normal. They're not sitting in meetings with their teammates. They're doing everything, you know, via Zoom. They're not uh, able to be in the locker room with that camaraderie because they're having to dress in waves, you know. Uh, it, it's just so different, and it's so exhausting. And I wouldn't blame anybody for not wanting to play in a bowl game. I wouldn't blame any kid or any family for saying, you know what, let's be together for Christmas, you know. Let's let's we don't We don't miss uh, – as football players and as Coach Moore can tell you, Coach Moore doesn't miss going to staff meetings every day for four hours. I don't miss practice, bro. I don't miss beating the crap out of other people. You miss the locker room. You miss busting balls. You miss having fun with your buddies. That's what makes it all worth it. Like, yes, it's fun to be on TV. It's fun to, for, for the pros to make all that money. But you enjoy it the most when you get to hang out with your dudes and bust on each other. And just that time, you'll always remember. That's what I would love to go back and do. Again, not go back and, and kick the crap out of people. Let's go back and hang with my homies. Well, and obviously Without this is going to be something that we'll continue to keep an eye on. In the meantime, let's move to one of the games that we are keeping an eye on today, and that's North Carolina taking on Miami. This is a big matchup. North Carolina started the season 3-0, and but they're 4-3 and since then. The Canes riding a five-game winning streak. Favored by 10. So, Pollock, what you got your eye on in this one? Quarterbacks. You know, when you when you look at Notre Dame, or the Notre Dame game with North Carolina, Sam Howell had his worst performance and got stymied. You look at the numbers, it's crazy how much they got held down. Bounce back. This is an offense that's just so dynamic, man. They got so many ways with Carter and Brown and Howell and just guys they can rotate in and out that can beat you. And so I think it's just – it's been fun to watch. It, it hasn't finished the way you said, and that's a little misleading too, Fitz. You say, oh, they're four and three down the stretch. Well, you go play Clemson and Notre Dame and see what everybody's record in the country is. You know, the teams that you, you know, you kind of lose down the stretch to. And actually, I didn't, no, that's not true. I didn't play Clemson, did they? Uh, well, but, and, and let me say, you, you make a fair point. They lost to Notre Dame, yes. But there is a little element of we were so hyped coming in, into the season, and, and maybe that's on all of us, like being so hyped about North Carolina coming into the year thinking maybe they could do the impossible. Coach, yeah. this, I don't I don't think this has necessarily gone the way that they expected in that sense. Well, look, David hit it. UNC on offense is really fun to watch. As a matter of fact, they're one of the, the teams that I really enjoy watching the most because they're balanced. They run it well. They have two great running backs. I love watching Sam Howe progress this year as not just a thrower, but as just a quarterback who understands the game and takes advantage of defenses. I like watching them game plan. I watched the Virginia Tech game. Virginia Tech had a great pass rush. They came out the first couple drives and absolutely minimized that rush, and I think they're going to have to do that again against Miami. You know, Miami can get after the quarterback a little bit. They've got 26 sacks. They've got 81 tackles for loss. Jalen Phillips 
you know, the transfer defensive end has six and a half sacks. He has 14 tackles for loss, so they can do some things up front. But it's a stiff challenge for Miami's defense, and I think it's going to be a really fun game to watch. We didn't even mention Derek King. You know, I mean, <laughs> this guy's done – Yep. Just about everything you could possibly do for everything. his offense at yep. Miami this year. All right, so now let's move to the game that, look, I just love giving this game love. Army-Navy deserves its own platform every single year. And this year, as always, they've given us some new unis. And they never disappoint. Coach, I mean, come on, you're a you're, you're coach. Like, are you in on these ever-changing uniforms? Like, do you love this? Do you hate this? Where are you on the uniform game? I love the classic uniforms. I like turning on the TV and knowing USC's playing or Ohio State's playing or Georgia's playing or Alabama's playing. But I also understand this day and age that these young men love the variety and they love the swag of the uniform. So I'm, I'm kind of split. I, I love the classics, but I understand where the game's going. Oh, and coach, I mentioned Georgia, It's easy David. to tell who's playing. <laughs> when, when it says... Georgia versus <laughs> Alabama, you know who's playing. I don't need to – it doesn't need to be a uniform that tells me who's playing. I love the changing of the uniforms. It's awesome. It's, it's always cool. It, it, makes it, it makes it more fun. It makes it unique. And, listen, look good, feel good, play good. Like, there's something to that. So, I think the kids love it. So, I love watching them have excitement. Yeah. So, a but year ago you, – you, Does Georgia ever go with a, an alternate uniform or a throwback? Did you guys ever do that in your day, David? <laughs> Back in my day, Coach, they would not let us do it. Shoot, we had to beg Coach Rick, man, for black cleats, bro. Like, we couldn't even get – Yeah, but – and then we leave, and then, the, and then they go, hey, yeah, uh, we'll do the blackout. And then they got destroyed by, by Alabama. So, it didn't work out so well for the blackout in that one. But, no, nah, I think we were more traditional. But now you're starting to see everywhere, man. It's cool. All right, so let's take a look at the other big storyline in college football every week right now is the Heisman. Uh, we've taken a look at this. The Heisman odds are courtesy of Caesar Sportsbook by William Hill. They got things at a dead heat between Mac Jones uh, and Kyle Trask. You can see the, the odds there on the screen. Uh, at this point, it seems like a two-man race between these two quarterbacks. I guess, Paul, like, maybe I'm over, oversimplifying things, but have we just forgotten how good Trevor Lawrence is? Yeah, I, I think it's it's Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields missing time, you know. But I, I do think if Trevor Lawrence played every game, this would be a different conversation. And going into the Notre Dame game, a huge opportunity to make a statement. By the way, I'd like to put Ian Book in there, too. I mean, Ian Book's been magical. I mean, he's made stuff happen. If he does it again against Clemson's defense, by the way, that now has those guys back and aren't as banged up, you know, he's another guy I think that could – jump up because he's had those moments that are just wow those Johnny football moments of scrambling around and throwing the ball with two hands and you know playing backyard football over and over again but it's it's a quarterback award nobody else is invited to the party you don't get to you don't get to be great unless you're a quarterback apparently you can only be the best player in college football if you're a quarterback so everybody else good luck <laughs> all right so coach if you had to make a choice in this race between Mac Jones Kyle Trask who do, who do you got I, I take Mac Jones. You know, I, I just I, I love the way he plays, the consistency with he plays with. I know he's got a great running back. He's got great receivers all over the place. But yeah, I love him as a decision maker. I love him as a guy that delivers the ball where it needs to be, when it needs to get there. I've seen him make every single throw. I think he's calm and cool under pressure. You know, I think that he steps up in the pocket well. It, he, he gets it to the guys that are going to make plays for him. You know, we're forgetting a couple of you – know, well, David said it. It's a, it's a quarterback award, and that's unfortunate, you know, because Devontae Smith, Kyle Pitts. You know, David made Oof. the point yesterday, Oof. these are two unstoppable forces in college football. You cannot defend these two guys. I mean, they make it happen. You can double cover them, triple cover them. You can't stop them. I mean, so let me ask you, Paul, because you make such a smart point that this has become a quarterback award. How do we fix that? <laughs> no going back. I mean, I just don't. I mean, I, I think if you <laughs> if you maybe found a way to limit the votes, um, I just I, I don't know. It's just every year it's not about the best player. It's about the most deserving player. I mean, if the team falls out of contention, you're, out, you're off the list 99% of the time unless the team in contention or the couple teams in contention don't have that stud. So, 
it is what it is. Um, I, I don't think it's going to change. But, you know, and Coach Morton mentioned this yesterday too, but when you're the quarterback and you touch the ball every play, when you're the quarterback, by the way, now, so many dual-threat quarterbacks. So what do people look at? They love to look at stats. Well, now – X can run and, and put in 500, 700, 1,000 yards. Well, oh, he's also got 10 rushing TDs. So it just it adds to what you're able to do and the stats you're allowed to accomplish. So I think it, it makes it easier. But how about Kyle Trask and, and Mac Jones? Neither one scrambling quarterbacks that are the two front runners for the Heisman. Well, and we'll see how it shakes out. I will give you credit, Pollock, for consistency. I've said it before. I'll say it again. A year ago on this show, Countdown to Game Day, you were talking about Chase Young saying, how do we make this a non-quarterback award? So you're a lot more popular than I'll ever be. So you got the platform, man. You can make the change. <laughs> Gentlemen, we appreciate you guys hanging out no. with us. <laughs> <laughs> no shot. <laughs> Stay safe out there. Thanks so much for hanging with us. If you can't make it to the playoff in Miami, don't you worry. You can join us virtually for the college football playoff all access experience featuring exclusive content and the chance to win prizes. Register today at collegefootballplayoff.com slash all access. It is just now hitting me that usually in a normal year you and I would have been going to Miami uh, and you have all the connects. Like you could have gotten me into no, all the clubs, it right? Been so, uh, <laughs> she was if you're go saying right, clubs like that, it's yeah. a heck no. no. No, I mean like you're going in the line and like you get yeah. to the front and then yeah, I yeah. look at the big guy and I'm like, hey, let me in the club. Yeah, and then they'd be like, no, are you seriously with no, this No, you've dude? got enough, like, clout between you, <laughs> Gary, like Gary Streisky. Like, this much clout. Okay. I mean, <laughs> the funny thing is, all kidding aside, though, I mean, this is a, a crazy yeah. year for the college football playoff, uh, but at some point, it's also a little bit of a conversation about what's good and what's bad, as you can see on the screen there. It's year seven. And, Insane. Like, it's a running joke, right? Like, at this point, we know that Alabama, Clemson, and then... Somebody else going to get in every single year. It's crazy. And I think the thing that has worked is it's kind of injected into the college football regular season this urgency to play well across the board. Because like you said, you got Alabama, Clemson, and then it's like, who else, right? So I feel like for sure it's helped teams want to play better throughout the season. But I mean, like you said, it's kind of like the same thing every single year. Well, so then it brings up the, the annual discussion about expansion. Like, mm -hmm. do we need more teams? Like, is it too repetitive? Would it be helpful like in a year? like now I mean yeah. you know every every week I feel like I'm coming in and saying Cincinnati well <laughs> if, if there were more teams I don't know where I went club and Cincinnati today. <laughs> if there were more teams uh, involved then Cincinnati would have a shot to prove themselves to it which would be a, a great concept and that's why a lot of people go to to expansion I just don't know how I feel about it. Where are you on it? Well, I mean, the best part of the college basketball season is March Madness, right? Because you see people come out of nowhere and beat teams, and you're like, who even is this team? I feel like it's a lot different with football, right? It's harder for a football team to play multiple games, and it's harder for us to figure out the logistics of that. But I do think it gives people a better chance of actually wanting to play for the postseason, because right now it's a lot harder to get teams invigorated to go into the postseason. So the reason I'm torn on all of this is because one versus four feels like half the time it's a slaughter, right? Yeah. Like the first game of the playoffs half the time isn't even good. So do we really want one versus eight? I mean, that's just going to be. Do we want to watch a bunch of blowouts? So I'm a little torn on it. Plus, I love the fact that it creates content. The fact is rankings reaction is a big show for yeah. us on Tuesday yeah, nights. Exactly. Is it as popular if we're debating eight versus nine? I don't know. But there is one argument that, frankly, by only getting these four teams in essentially the the it, it's sort of like a funnel and so now all the recruits are looking at these particular teams that sit at the top maybe if there was playoff expansion it would also expand the conversation about playoffs to recruits which would then make other teams other destinations a little more enticing and spread the ingredients out uh, to more kitchens because right now it feels like you got two <laughs> two kitchens that are cooking with everything i love the ingredients oh yeah I'm, I'm i love food. the analogy uh, but like you're right you're right we've seen top players go to top schools every single year and speaking of recruiting national signing day is coming up on wednesday next week for the top overall recruits in the espn 300 the last few years there's been some good ones 2018 had quarterback Justin Fields at number one. He signed with Georgia, transferred to Ohio State, where things have gone pretty, pretty well. In 2019, defensive end Kayvon Thibodeau signed with the Oregon Ducks in his first season with the Ducks. He had nine sacks, but just two this season. Then in 2020, Ohio State signed wide receiver Julian Fleming, who hadn't had too much action this season, just three catches, but the Buckeyes are extra deep at wide receiver and don't really need him. And then in 2021, the top overall recruit this year, Jack 
Sawyer. He is headed for Ohio State. Sawyer is 6'5", 230 pounds, defensive end from Ohio. He opted to skip his senior season to enroll early at Ohio State. He's 6'5", and 230, and he's in high school? I mean, it happens. I know it doesn't happen in your life. I wasn't. Uh, but... Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm 5'9 and a quarter. And let me just say, I was not short in high school. I was average height. I feel like I've lost everything. Go ahead, Chris. I mean, I'm a tad bit taller than you, so I don't know what average, honestly, is when it comes to male height. But anyways, we welcome in our very own Tom Barron. And you have a little bit more information on this recruiting cycle. So I just mentioned the guy that's going into Ohio State in the 6'5", 230. He's the number one recruit in this recruiting class in Ohio State does and actually have the number one recruiting class. It's actually Alabama. So what do they need to do to kind of close in on Alabama? Well, first of all, I'm about five eight and a half, so I'm going to stick up for the average size there. Okay, yes, I think that's sir. that's very average, very average. I guess I'm above average. Uh -huh. I don't know. Thank you. You played volleyball in college. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Tom. Give yourself some credit. You are above average and we're <laughs> average. But you're right. Ohio, Ohio State does not have the number one ranked class right now. That belongs to Alabama. And I think this is actually going to be a pretty tight race for the number one class down to the wire. Alabama right now has 17 ESPN 300 commitments. They have three five stars. Ohio State just got a commitment from ESPN 300 wide receiver Emeka Igbuka. So that gives them 17 ESPN 300 commitments commitments, but only two five stars. And I say only very, very loosely there because two, two five stars is outstanding, but they're one behind Alabama. So I think the, the linchpin in all of this, the guy that could set the tone or actually set the race for the number one ranked class in the country is ESPN 300 defensive tackle JT Tuimolau. He's considering Ohio State and he's also considering Alabama among a couple other schools. He's the number four ranked prospect in the country. Now, he is heavily considering Ohio State. A lot of people think the Buckeyes are actually in the lead for him right now. But we're not going to find out where he's going to pick in this early signing period. He's very likely to wait till January or February. So the race for number one might get drawn out until the February signing period. But I think it's going to be very close. I do think Ohio State has a shot to catch Alabama. And then a few other schools in the mix as well. Georgia at number three, LSU at number four. Georgia's got some big prospects on the board still. They've got 14 ESPN 300 commitments right now. Xavier Sori, the number 20 ranked prospect overall, a linebacker still considering them. And then LSU, defensive tackle Mason Smith. He's one of the top in-state prospects in Louisiana. They're still in offensive lineman Tristan Lee and still technically in it for defensive end Corey Foreman as well. They also have 14 ESPN 300 commitments, so they maybe could sneak up in that race as well, but I do think ultimately what it comes down to is Ohio State and Alabama going after it for that number one class. Tom, you just mentioned LSU. They've had a garbage of a season. We all know that. A lot of that recruiting was done during a national championship season. So how does what's happened on the field this year impact that recruiting class? We always say that recruiting is actually a little bit ahead. So the, the process happens so fast now that a lot of these prospects were already committed before the season even started. They already had their minds made up. So whether it's a good season or a bad season, you usually see it in the next class. You just mentioned that championship season was last year. We're now seeing a little bit of a bump, the number four ranked class for LSU in this class. They got a bump last year. So I'm looking at the 2022 class, these next, this next Next cycle to see if they take a hit uh, and where they end up unless they can turn things around. Now, that, that being said, if you look at the class rankings, LSU has always had pretty good numbers. They've always had highly ranked classes. So even though I, I, I say I'm going to watch the 2022 class, I don't know how big of a hit they're going to take because that staff, that program seems to always have really highly ranked classes when it comes down to it. Speaking of people having to adjust because of things. I mean, it's 2020. We're still in the middle of a pandemic. Obviously, players can't go to campus. They can't do the recruiting thing as they have in the past. So what have coaches and players and teams been talking about? How have they had to adjust this season? 
That, that's really been the biggest challenge is not being able to take those visits. And the NCAA imposed a dead period back in March. And initially, we really weren't sure how long that dead period was going to last. And here we are. Now they've extended it through next April, April 15th, 2021. So they've gone the whole year without being able to take visits, without being able to get kids on campus. And another aspect of this, coaches haven't been able to go out to high schools and evaluate recruits. We talked to Ohio State defensive coordinator Kerry Combs recently, and he told us he likes to go into the high school and, and likes to try to evaluate personalities of prospects by talking to anybody and everybody in the high school. He said, I'll talk to the, the cafeteria later, lady. I'll talk to the janitor. And he said, right now, I can't Zoom the janitor because I don't know his number and I don't know how to get a hold of him. So he, he's had, from an evaluation standpoint, a more difficult time. And then really adjusting to the visits, not being able to get kids on campus Coaches have been using Zoom, FaceTime, trying to get at least uh, the ability to, to have eye-to-eye -eye contact, whether even though it's through a screen, to try to build those relationships. And those, those have really been the biggest challenges so far. And the other challenge that they're facing right now is the, the NCAA put together a rule that said everybody gets an extra year of eligibility if they want it. So seniors, normally that would be leaving off of the uh, off of the roster this year. They can stick around next year. Now, they can go over the 85 total scholarship limits. So schools can go over whatever, however many seniors were planning on, on staying. If th those seniors were going to leave, you can go over by that number, over the 85 total scholarship limit. That helps. But there are problems with that because over the limit, you still have to pay the, for those scholarships. That's hundreds of thousands of dollars that coaches are going to have to pay for scholarships. And then beyond that, we don't really know what's going to happen if they can go over the total in 2022 as well. So there's still some uncertainty left with the scholarship numbers and what they're going to do going forward with these recruiting classes. Tom, we appreciate you hanging out with us. It's so crazy to be it's thinking insane. about the games right now, but also then Curtin yeah. always got to work on it, so we appreciate all your help, my friend. Yeah, no problem. From an average height guy to an average height guy, yes. <laughs> well said by him, by the way. Well said by Everybody him. Everybody can be above average. <laughs> Here is what you can expect later on game day at 9.50 a.m., Roger Staubach joins the show, a member of both the College and Pro Football Hall of Fame. Staubach was the last member of Service Academy to win the Heisman. Then, at 10.40 a.m., the post-championship hangover has been large for the Tigers. Coach O sits down with Tom Rinaldi to discuss LSU's rough 2020 season. At 11.30 a.m., another reason... At number one, Nick Saban joins the show to talk Tide and having not just one, but two Heisman candidates this year. It's time for Fitz's Biggest Moments, brought to you by Samsung QLED TV. You know what we do. Take a look at the four biggest games of the weekend that you need to have your eyes on, and we rank them. So let's start at number four with a little Pac-12 love. That's right, the victory bell is at stake. USC taking on UCLA. Look at that hop. Oh, USC is trying to hop their way into an undefeated season against the rival UCLA, although UCLA would have to be good for it to be a rivalry. In at number three, Georgia taking on Missouri. Georgia is singing what might have been constantly right now. Their offense has finally woken up. The problem is you lost two games early, so none of it means anything if you wanted to win the SEC. But still, they're playing for something. It's called pride and a higher ranking from the college football playoff committee. In at number two. Miami taking on North Carolina. Remember when we all said that North Carolina could somehow, some way, make their way into the ACC championship game? Oops. Well, at least they can make Miami's season more difficult. That much we know. In the battle of quarterbacks and explosions, defense will be optional in this one. And last up at the top of the list, rightfully so, because it always belongs at the top of the list, Army-Navy, this game is usually by itself for a reason because the entire nation should pay attention to this. It means more than just football. For the first time since 1943, this game will be played on the campus of West Point. Absolutely the game to watch, not just because of football, but because of everything that's sacrificed by all of these young men that give so much to our country. Yeah, you can't hold me down. I'm worried to be the best quarterback in the country. Yeah, how you like me now? Every day. 
I'm gonna strive to be that. It's what I signed up for. Field spins and gets to the end zone. Can I been blowing up, blowing up, blowing up, hit him with the right hook, left foot. Field just continues to be brilliant. But my main goal is to win every game and of course win the national championship. Going up, yeah. Truly, I cannot with Fitz's dance moves right now. Uh who needs actually, the club when I got the club right here? It actually surprises Ooh. me that you were once a full-time musician, considering the fact that your moves are so I have great rhythm. I just can't dance. Uh, okay, anyways, we were talking. We just saw Justin, Justin Fields. Justin Fields and Ohio State Buckeyes got the most wonderful gift from the Big Ten because they no longer have the six-game minimum requirement to be in the Big Ten Championship, which is a big deal, so now they can play in it. Now they can get a shot at the CFP. So in that same vein, we have decided that we should gift – some college football teams, players, coaches with some Christmas gifts because it's Christmas. I love Almost. this. It's Christmas season, right? I'm all in. So, Fitz, I'm going to ask you, what should we give Coach Harbaugh? Oh, that one's easy. An NFL job. What is under the mask? Like, does he have a long nose we don't know about? Is he eating a carrot bag? He's like, what's up, Doc? I don't know what's going on. <laughs> okay. We all know that Harbaugh stays somewhere for a couple years, wears out his welcome, and then suddenly moves on. It's time for him to do that. Multiple reports have said that he's been uh, courted by a couple of NFL teams. Let him have him. He'll go somewhere. He'll be great for a couple of years. Then he'll be marred in mediocrity, and everybody will want to move on. I got this. Okay, you ready for your turn? That just made it sound like you're a little bit of the Grinch, but yes. No, 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 no. I'm giving him what he wants. He keeps making money. All right, so what does Texas get in their stocking? So Texas needs a fresh start because unlike Sam Ellinger said a couple years ago, or was that last season, they are not back. So what would be really good for them is to get rid of Tom Herman, even though I like the guy, and even though Urban Meyer has said he does not want the Texas job, they need Santa to sprinkle his, what is it, magic fairy dust and make Urban Meyer want this job because this team really need some rejuvenation and I feel like Urban Meyer can offer that to the long course. Maybe I was wrong and Harbaugh should just go down there. Okay, so <laughs> next I'll let you ask this one. I'll go next. All right, T-Long, what are we giving him for Christmas? Okay, so I had to think about this one a lot, but I, it's a two-part answer. Uh -huh. Number one, I'm giving Trevor Lawrence a Buddy the Elf doll because nobody loves New York better, <laughs> more than Buddy the Elf. But most importantly, I'm giving him a massive fur coat because the last time the Jets had an epic quarterback. His name was Joe Namath. He wore the fur coat. It keeps you warm in the New York Christmas time. So uh -huh. I'm helping him get ready for New York with a fur coat and a Buddy the Elf doll. He also needs to get drafted number one because he has a wedding coming up that he needs to pay for. Oh, yeah. God knows. Can't pay for a wedding based on that number two overall salary. Okay. <laughs> All right. Last up on this. Who do you have as the hot gift of the season? Everybody knows, like, this time of year you're scouring the yeah, web. Yeah. Who do you have as the hot gift? So, you know I'm a big 12 person. I am obsessed with Matt Campbell for many reasons. He's a great guy, but also he's a really good coach. In five years at Iowa State, he has completely rejuvenated that program. He has gotten them from completely irrelevant to now being in the CFP conversation and nobody wants to be in Ames, Iowa. I have been there. So the fact that he is holding it down in Ames and doing it and with a team that did not, we did not expect this out of them, I think it is an amazing gift to the Iowa State fan base. Okay, okay so I like that. By the way, yes. Uh, it, it was a real realization last year when people were like, what do you do in Ames? And I'm like, you're touring country music. You've been to Ames a lot. Okay. I'm going to, though, you, you're using your Big 12 fandom. I'm going to go with my fandom of Cincinnati this year. The hot gift, Luke Fickle. See, let, let's say that you've got the Xbox. I've got the new PS5. My <laughs> PS5 is Luke Fickle, who is going to find his way into the conversation. He turned down the Michigan State job in a surprise to many. He did that, in my mind, because he knew bigger things were coming, Cough, Michigan. So now he's going to find his way to an even bigger, better opportunity. I wish he'd stay in Cincinnati because I love the story, but come on now. Like, somebody's going to throw dirty money at Luke Fickle. And that's what you do, Chris. is a hot present of the year. You That's get that the cash thing out. about these these coaches. They're so good, like Matt Campbell, Luke Fickle, in the places that they are. But, you know, they got to go to bigger and better places. Yeah, well, that's part of the process of it. Uh, in the meantime, we want to take a second and say thank you for hanging out with us all season long. It's been an honor to get to be part of your Saturday morning tradition. You can stick around on ESPN here in the app. You can watch the game day crew take it over. In the meantime, there's a lot of people behind the scenes that are a huge part of the show. We want to thank every single person that helped make this happen every week. She's Christine Williams. Williamson. I'm Jason Fitz. Thank you so much for hanging out on Countdown to Game Day, presented by Samsung QLED TV. Have oh, a great Saturday. Oh, oh.
Merry Christmas! <laughs>